the history tells us that the you know 12 months following the the having are the the hyperbolic move cycle and that, that that makes sense right just logically what does the having do well it it cuts the supply of block rewards that pay the miners for securing the network so if the miners costs are relatively fixed and their revenue goes down in theory a whole bunch of them would go away unless the price were to move i think it's one of the most ingenious parts of the code. And there's a lot of ingenious parts to the code. But the fact is, in every previous halving, basically what happens is the fair value of the network doubles. Now, there is one nuance this time. And, you know, I don't know if you've been following it very closely, but, you know, there's the whole uh, development of ordinals a year plus ago. And now, as of the halving, there was this uh, development of, of runes, basically meme coins or the, the technology to do meme coins on, on Bitcoin. And, you know, everybody's talking about it and some people hate it and some people love it. The reality is what it does is it generates a lot of transaction fees yep. and transaction fees also reward the miners. So I think this time, instead of the you know fair value today, Tim Peterson would tell you is somewhere in the low 50s, I'll even round down to be conservative to 50. Normally, in a, in a having that goes to 100, uh, but let's say this time it only goes to 80 because the transaction fee offset. You know, that's just that's that's made up math, but but that sounds it sounds right. And then in a normal cycle, we go to 2.3x fair value because of the FOMO and, and all the momentum and the leverage. But I think leverage is lower this time. So 200. Oh, do we get to 150? Yeah, I think we and get fair to value is 80 and we, uh, you know, two and a half exit. We, we get to 200. Well, I, I, like I think that. we double this time. So, so let's yeah. say 150, 160. And that would be by April, May of 25. As Mark Yusko highlighted, the halving is a crucial event where the reward for mining Bitcoin transactions is cut in half, fundamentally altering the supply of new Bitcoins entering the market. History has shown us that the periods following past halvings have led to significant hyperbolic price movements. This makes sense because reducing the supply of block rewards should, theoretically, decrease the incentive for miners unless there's a compensatory rise in Bitcoin's price. Despite the halving, which normally would double the fair value of the network, the addition of transaction fees might adjust these expectations slightly. Instead of doubling, we might see a more conservative increase in value, perhaps up to 80%, according to experts like Tim Peterson. But even with these changes, the fundamentals of supply and demand remain. With miners receiving less for their efforts, the scarcity of Bitcoin increases, which historically has led to a rise in price as demand continues or increases. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more in-depth analysis and expert insights here at Unscripted Crypto. This can be the best Thanksgiving ever, right? No more, you're not welcome because you're a crypto person in the family. People are gonna be like, oh, come on, come on, come. It's gonna be awesome. And people are gonna celebrate the, the crypto people in the family this year. And so if that FOMO period is like the previous two, where from November to December, you know, yeah. go up yeah. orders of magnitude. I mean, remember, we went from 10,000 to 20,000 in eight weeks. And very quickly to 42 once we eventually broke it the next time. Yeah. Right. I mean, with the with the Elon Musk buying Tesla news, I think sent it to 40 that time in, in that cycle. Here's so uh, we have the four year cycle. It's been reliable. The having has been reliable doesn't mean it will happen this time. There is a few other differences besides the transaction fees that you mentioned. Obviously, we've preempted the halving with an all-time high, which yeah. we've never done before. And this time, I think the halving, when you actually look at how much supply is reduced in dollar terms, relative to the amount of volume we're getting from ETFs and other factors is minimal, right? I mean, you're talking about a few billion dollars in supply reduced over the period of a year which now becomes, uh, you know, 10 days of outflows in GBTC, right? Or, or like uh, five no, it's a days really, of strong buying on IBIT. It's a really important point, right? 
you know, there are there are multiple factors in markets. And, and the biggest one really is supply and demand, you know, basic econ 101. And we had a, a pretty significant demand shift. And it hasn't fully played out. In fact, it hasn't even come close to fully playing out. The, the math that, that, that always amazes me, I believe in the next 12 months-ish, so we're a couple months, you know, about three months into the ETF, and, and we've gotten about 10% of what I believe is coming into this space from the, the registered investment advisors that control all the boomers' cash. So the boomers have 30 odd trillion with these financial advisors. Not all of them. Well, UBS still hasn't said I can buy GB, uh, IBIT in my, in my account, right? It's my money, my account. I can't buy it because they know what's good for me. Vanguard, same thing. Well, so yeah. there's going to be 300 billion, I believe. That's 1% of 30 trillion that comes in to this space. Scott, that's actually more money than has ever converted to Bitcoin in 15 years. That's a pretty amazing thing because what people forget is that multiplier effect of the bid ask, right? I convert some fiat into Bitcoin, but then I don't want to sell it. So someone's got to bid a higher price to get me to, to sell. And so you get that multiplier. And I don't think the multiplier is whatever Bank of America says, 118. Yeah, when, when we were talking pennies or dollars or $10 or $20, the multiplier was really, really big. Today, I'm going to say the multipliers probably more like 20-ish, you know? So 300 billion would add 6 trillion of market cap. Here's the crazy thing. In people's 401k, they set the allocation on the day they start their job and they choose one over X. So if there are seven choices, they put one seventh in each and they never change <laughs> and they never rebalance, not ever. So people putting this in their 401k, I mean, not the 401k, in their retirement account, their IRA, it's over. And, and to your point, they're not gonna stare at it. They're not gonna look at it. And this idea that number go up, that's not the point. The point is, the utility is going to continue to go up. The embracing of the technology is going to continue to go up. And at the end of the day, it is a finite asset. People say, well, you know, that Satoshi could show up and, and add more. No, no Jam Jameson Lop <laughs> showed us the lines of code that prohibit that. Now, it's like five lines, lines, by the way. It's yeah. Five lines of code prevent that yeah. entire narrative. But yeah. And and the thing is, fine, could 51% of the participants change that? Sure. But the likelihood of that happening is is really low. And the reason behind it, why it might happen, could be really interesting. So it's kind of like a stock split. But all of that aside, the demand for blockchain technology, of which Bitcoin is a blockchain. I love, I love this whole debate, right? Bitcoin, not blockchain, 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 not Bitcoin. Yeah, of course. Like they, they're, they're the same thing, right? We have the Bitcoin network, that is a blockchain network, and the Bitcoin token, which secures the network through block rewards. I don't know why we debate this. I just, just makes no sense to me. Mark Yusko gave us a glimpse into a future where being a crypto person at the family Thanksgiving isn't just accepted, but celebrated. This shift in perception is critical as it reflects broader acceptance and integration of crypto into everyday life. But what's more intriguing is how this social change intersects with market dynamics. Consider the previous cycles Mark mentioned, where rapid price increases followed the halving events and major corporate buy-ins, like Tesla's significant investment in Bitcoin. These are not just market movements, they're societal events that draw new participants into the market. And as this cycle continues, we're seeing new elements play a role such as the influence of ETFs and institutional money flowing from registered investment advisors controlling boomer cash. This isn't just about young tech enthusiasts anymore. It's about serious, traditional financial capital moving into crypto. The potential influx of $300 billion into cryptocurrencies could be transformative, 
increasing the market cap exponentially. This influx is driven by both the financial mechanics and the growing utility and acceptance of the technology. In essence, while the mechanics of supply and demand dictate short-term price movements, the long-term value of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies will likely be shaped by their acceptance into mainstream finance and society. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.